Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're starting a new topic on joints. It's only a short topic and to start us off, this video will look at classifying the different types of joints. So, joints are classified based on how the bones are joined together and the amount of movement the joint permits. There are three main types of joints that have different levels of mobility. They're called fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial joints. So I'll run you through each one of those, making sure we cover what the hell those three weird names mean, the structure of each type of joint, their function, and of course, an example of each. Oh, and a little hint before we dive in, often the names of the joint classifications help you to remember some key features about that classification. So look out for those helpful connections. Firstly, let's look at fibrous joints. This is an example of a joint that's name is based on how the bones are joined together because fibrous joints are joints that are connected by a strong, inflexible fibrous tissue. There is no mobility in these joints. They simply join bones together and keep them there. For example, our skulls are made of more than one bone. If you didn't already know that, I've probably just blown your mind. So pause the video and give yourself some time for that imminent existential crisis. For everyone else, let's continue. All of these bones are connected by fibrous joints. It's probably a good thing that they can't move if you think about it, because otherwise our brain would be exposed and vulnerable to damage. Helpful little brain trick I use to remember this classification is fibrous sounds like fused. So the bones are pretty much fused together and they don't move at all. The next major type of joint we talk about is cartilaginous joints. And again, these are named based on how the bones are connected. Cartilaginous joints are connected entirely by cartilage, which is a flexible connective tissue. Cartilage is the bendy but hard stuff that your ears are made of, but we can also find it in other parts of our bodies, such as joints. So these joints have slightly more mobility than fibrous joints because cartilage is not as strong and rigid as fibrous tissue. However, there is still only minimal movement in a cartilaginous joint. An example of a cartilaginous joint which demonstrates this is the first sternocostal joint, which is the joint between the rib and the sternum. Well, technically, it attaches to the uppermost part of the sternum, which is called the manubrium. But that's just some fun physical ed trivia. You won't need to know that level of detail for your revision and exams. Stick with the sternum and you'll be right. It's important that the first sternocostal joint has some flexibility because the ribs need to move with every breath so that our lungs can expand and deflate. But that's about all that can happen there because cartilaginous joints are not super mobile. Again, if you think about it, it's probably for the best because right next to your first rib lies some pretty important real estate, including major arteries, veins and nerves. So we don't want to bump or move them at all. Okay, so probably the most important type of joint, or at least for the sake of studying physical education, is the synovial joint. Synovial joints are different to the previous two types because the two bones aren't touching each other. They're actually inside a joint cavity, aka joint capsule, which is filled with synovial fluid. There you go, another way to remember the features of the classification just by looking at the name. A joint cavity creates an insular little world for the two bones, and the synovial fluid is the atmosphere of that world. It provides the joint with nutrients and helps the bones glide across each other easily. Synovial joints offer full range of motion in at least one direction, and combined, they allow us to participate in sports, exercise, and pretending to work out at the gym so that we can do a hashtag Fitzbo gram. Uh, I mean, what? I don't do that. <laughs> anyway, the first type of synovial joint is the ball and socket joint. This one is named based on its structure and is my favourite because it's so easy to remember. You can see here that the joints include a bone with a spherical head, the ball, and a cup-like socket that the ball sits in. This joint has the highest freedom of movement because of its structure. The bone can virtually move in any direction. As humans, we only have two ball and socket joints in our bodies, and they are the hip and shoulder joints. Try and move your arm in any direction. Besides looking like a crazy person, you should be able to see that there's not a lot of restriction in the shoulder joint, and that's because of its unique structure. So next, let's look at hinge joints. 
These joints are named after the structure as well. They're exactly like a hinge on a door. Bones within this type of joint can only move along one axis, meaning they can only move in one line. Exactly what a door does, only open and close. Some examples of hinge joints are the knee joint, the ankle joint and the elbow joint. This is because our knees only move in one plane. They bend and straighten. If they started to move side to side, I'd recommend catching the next ambulance to hospital and getting that sorted out. The next type of synovial joint we'll look at is the pivot joint. This one is pretty clearly named after a movement. So, these joints allow bones to pivot around each other. The best example of a pivot joint is at the neck, between the atlas and axis bones. Those are the first two vertebrae of the spine. Having a pivot joint between those vertebrae is the reason we can move our neck from side to side when we shake our head after the teacher asks, do you want homework tonight? Thank goodness for the pivot joint. Alrighty, yet another type of synovial joint is the condyloid joint, which has a few other names like condyla or ellipsoid joint. This joint consists of an oval-shaped end of one bone fitting into a similarly shaped hollow in the other bone. There's not as much mobility as a ball and socket in these joints. For example, our wrist joint is a condyloid joint, so it can move both side to side and up and down. Now, although the condyloid joint can technically only move in two directions or planes of movement, when these movements are combined, so when you move your wrist a little to one side and down a bit and then start creeping over to the other side, you could eventually move your wrist around in a circular type motion. Moving on to the next type of joint, let's talk about gliding joints, which like our good old condyloid joint has a few other names, including planar or plane joints. These ones are named based on their structure because at these joints, the bones that meet have flat or slightly curved surfaces, so they just glide on each other. There's not a lot of movement in these joints at all. It's best understood when we take a look at our intercarpal joints, which are just the joints where the little bones in our hand, not our fingers, just the ones in the palm of our hands, meet. These bones and joints don't actually perform any specific movements, but they glide along each other to allow the fingers to move in all sorts of ways. Alrighty guys, nearly there. The final type of synovial joint we need to look at is the saddle joint which is named after its structure and its movement. This is because the movement in saddle joints resembles a rider on horseback who can shift in several directions. The saddle is the base of the joint and the rider sits on top. Take our thumb joint for example. Our thumb joint is a saddle joint. The base of the thumb is the saddle and the thumb can move in two planes of movement from there. The movements are kind of like the condyloid joint but the saddle joints provide more stability to the bones compared to other similar joints because of its unique structure. Okay, that's all from me today team. Thanks for watching. I've made a summary table for you showing the different types of joints and their movement, also with an example. So feel free to pause, pause, pause me and pop it in your notes. And just a note for all the keen beans out there, you won't have to know how to classify every single joint in the body. Just make sure you know the main examples that we covered in this video. Catch you next time.